So I kind of felt like turning Greece into an empire. And not just any empire, like the Byzantine. The Macedonian Empire was what I wanted. It's by far the hardest form of you can do as Greece. And it's sort of secret, as you can only do it if you go fascist, with George Mercurius as your leader. And this formable is never described or marked anywhere in the Greek focus tree. Obviously, we were going to need a lot of land, just like the real-life Macedonian Empire. But it was going to take me around five years to be ready for any type of war. My grand scheme would be to do the agrarian industrial path, then the four-year plan, then quickly go fascist in time to join the Axis. Then, being completely safe from any wars like the Italian one, I'd build up for as long as I liked. Once I was ready, I'd have to go to war with Bulgaria, Albania, Turkey, Iran, Iraq, France, India, UK, the Soviet Union, and Afghanistan. As we devaluate the Frachmi, we were now able to pay back our debts, which have been causing a massive drag on the state, stability and consumer goods wise. The debts were going to take around a year to pay back, but the Frachmi focus opened up the industrial paths for us to spend time on. We had two options, either rapidly industrialize or invest in the agrarian economy Greece already had built up. Going down that road was something I, as a pretty frequent Greece player, knew would be better for us. It would immediately kickstart our military production, as the first focus removed a really serious minus 30% factory output debuff we were suffering with. And moving further down, we get four sieves, four mills, and infrastructure that our wasteland of a country really needed. Now the four year plan focus was where things would really start to pick up steam. It gives us plus 25% sieve construction speed. Now we had to focus on the politics of our state. Time was passing by fast, and our quest to become fascist would be as much as 11 focuses long. So as we moved down the tree, we began indoctrinating children into our ideology and cracking down on Republicans, which gave the state an extra 10 stability. And we were now able to follow in the footsteps of giants. As the political landscape of Greece had been changing, our industrial landscape had been true. A civilian industry had grown to such a massive scale we literally didn't have enough room in the country to build anything else except infrastructure. The great Greek industrialization project went above and beyond in its success with 50 sieves before 1940. Politically, I was able to complete the modern movement focus where the grand fascist boule of Halikarnassus was held. Greece had two futures, one under Metaxas dictatorship and one under a national socialist, Mercuris Empire. His vision of Greece was to reclaim the Macedonian Empire. He was the man we needed. As Bulgaria joined the Axis, I did too. And the next stage of the Hellenic state would begin. It was the year 1949 and the Bulgarians had recently unleashed the IMRO in central Macedonia and Thrace. A paramilitary suit in our land that had caused us to lose our cores on those states, we had to crush them. The reassimilation of our land took three months and torpedoed some of our auxiliary equipment into the negatives. Our own faction members meddling in our affairs would take some wind out of the sails of our eventual Turkish invasion, which had to be delayed by around a year, by which some of that time was spent establishing a strong collaboration government in Turkey for post-occupation stability and growth. But a war with Turkey would mean being dragged into World War II, as Britain had guaranteed their independence. No doubt, an Anatolian campaign would be hard to succeed in. Allied units would swarm the very defensible mountains of this state. I could form a concrete wall that may prove impossible to break through. But being a land of mountains, we knew how to fight in them. And of course we invested heavily into the Hellenic Air Force. We had 1.6 thousand trained, war-ready fighter planes and 700 cast. The air power would break the inevitable stalemate, but how we'd cross the Istanbul Strait, we didn't know, breaking through Asia Minor into the Middle East and still being able to hold Turkey and Greece against any possible naval landings, we did not know how to guarantee that either, just had to hope nothing went wrong. In May 1944, Greece declared war on Turkey, alone, hoping to keep it an isolated conflict. But Turkey would join Britain into the Allies and join the war against the Axis as a whole, the conflict now boiling over into the wider picture of World War II. As the Greeks sit on the border, Operation Gordian would commence. 
Me easily broke down Edirn, and the shock of the offensive being so great, we were able to push the low organization units holding the strait. As the offensive grew larger in its front line and advancing east, we were able to see the first few allied divisions grow into something quite worrying. But we had the air power. What we lacked was any concentrated offensives. I had to mass all my divisions into the center, and only then games were being made, achieving quite a big encirclement and an even bigger one shortly after. With this massive outmaneuver and occupation of Turkish land, the government decided to capitulate under our rule, and we simply had to clean up the allied mess, the encirclements, of which there were hundreds of thousands of men in. The momentum we had gained was so great it was impossible to stop. We were blitzing through French Syria, landed in Cyprus, and took the Sinai Peninsula, which was right on the front door of the Suez Canal. As logistics were prepared and ready, an operation into Egypt commenced and would go incredibly well. With these successes, the national color had changed as did the prestige of the state. Advancing into Libya and reaching Benghazi, it was decided no further advancements would be made into the Libyan wasteland. As the Regno del Sud had become the major power in Italy, a Greek expeditionary force was instead sent to aid the northern government, accomplishing an astounding victory in Yugoslavia. Having moved into North Italy, there the units encircled over half a million men and moved down south swiftly to fully liberate Italy, another amazingly successful Greek campaign. With the amount of victories we were achieving on a monthly basis, we ran out of battles to fight against the Allies in the West. It was time to turn around and conduct a campaign in the East instead. For now, we had avoided this due to Iraq being in the Japanese faction and Japan being our only source of rubber. But now with our own nationalized synthetic rubber plants spanning the nation, we were free to invade Japanese allies. Iraq fell quickly and was occupied. Iran followed. Now was where I met the Allies once again. The British Raj front was going to have to be held, while a Soviet Afghanistan would be pushed into, beginning the Greco-Soviet War. The battles in the East were logistical nightmares. It was characterized by out of supply, Greek units desperately fighting over enemy supply hubs. One in the South was conquered, while in the North, Kabul took quite a bit of time to reach, after which the Northern Front would begin. The Soviets were temporarily knocked out of the fight after a huge encirclement, after which the front became static indefinitely. A massive campaign into the British Raj began, as it was now our number one priority to take the state out. The progress here was steady, but fickle. The weaknesses in numbers and stretching of manpower was beginning to show. As we did not have a big manpower pool, we had to rely solely on the Germans to close our gaps, who were not reliable. We reached a point where, without any extra divisions, we were not going to beat India. The front went cold, but then Germany was starting to lose its own footing. Their equipment stockpiles were devastated, and so with our massive stockpiles, I sent an incredibly large lend lease to the Germans. While we definitely could not have helped Italy on the battlefield, we were the ones keeping air superiority alive in North Italy. Through a year of air fighting in the Alpine region, we had acquired 2,000 fighter planes who had become so experienced they were veteran level. By this point, the Hellenic Air Force had become the most experienced and strongest one in the world. As more units arrived on the Indian front, we began pushing once again. And cutting through the Indians, we divided the state into two, taking the south off and then heading north, where we pushed into Burma, and would meet a new foe, the Chinese, who had just recently joined the Allies. We stopped at Burma until further notice. Now during the fervor and excitement of our games, we had gotten a little ahead of ourselves. The Axis powers were poor allies in many ways, but what they did best was distract the allied powers. It was good for business for the two factions to clash, because eventually I would have to turn on my allies and invade the Axis to complete the formable. But they were starting to perform too poor, because as each year passed, the Axis was growing weaker and weaker. Germany had around 20 million casualties at this point. I had seen many times how they were on scraping the barrel and despite that had no manpower. I just had to hope that my allies wouldn't collapse and support them in any way I could, like air. My entire army was in Asia and I absolutely could not spawn in new divisions due to a lack of manpower. I had to take out Asia, most importantly China, where the fertile land would net the empire millions of manpower reserves. After that, we then turned around to the west. That was how we were going to win. And one of the linchpins of this grand plan would be the beginning of stage three. It was time to concentrate on the newly established and bolstered Hellenic Navy. 
With a fleet of two carriers, one battleship and one heavy cruiser, with offensive light cruisers and 120 roach destroyers, with an additional 1,000 naval bomber air force, I was confident we would win a capital engagement with the British, at least one. To have an empire, you need to have an undefeatable navy, as it is vital to your security, intercontinental logistics operations, and reinforces your land in a way infantry would never be able to. If I took out the Allied Navy, it would mean complete security of the state, relieving the 100 division sized garrison we had accrued during all our campaigning. I was hunting in the Mediterranean for the British fleet, and eventually I found it in the Adriatic Sea. The battle would begin, and I would lose a heavy, light cruiser, with my battleship barely escaping with its life. My strategy and naval composition were good, and no doubt about that, it had always worked. I just needed more ships, more numbers if I wanted to beat the British. As land operations like those in Siam continued, and years passed, the Navy expanded quietly. Until during the process, I decided to explore naval bomber upgrades. Something I didn't do before as I saw how little my basic bombers were doing and didn't think upgrades would improve anything. But deciding to experiment with heavy torpedo mounts, I was left with the slightest curiosity about how these would perform in action. And almost immediately, it took out a destroyer. It was raiding convoys with air. I had never seen anything like it before. And now, with a fleet of four carriers, six battleships, and three heavy cruisers, I put it out into the sea to hunt the British Navy. Eventually, I found them in the central Mediterranean, and it was time for revenge. And oh, did I wipe the floor with them. I lost one sub compared to their five capitals. And the after battle hunting netted me another three battleships and kills. My capitals were literally not even scratched. With this newfound naval supremacy, we landed in Malta very easily. And having recently liberated Italy, we would use Sicily to land in French Algeria. A new land campaign was upon us in the west. All the while my nav bombers were taking out capitals by themselves. This new technology had to be used in probably our most sensitive territory. What I like to call the Deep Belly, India. If any massive hostile force landed here, they'd encircle my entire ongoing operation into collaborative China. So not only air, but my navy was sent there, as the Mediterranean was firmly ours even without any surface fleets there. Here we met the US Navy, and as expected, stomped them without even a scratch done to the battleships, with also a few British remnants being taken out, again solely by our bombers. After a few more victories, I confidently had to seize at my fingertips. The Allied navies were simply too bruised by this point to fight me. As we fully conquered the Mediterranean and locked the door by taking Gibraltar, Halnick conquests would not cease. Operations into Singapore were running. Our second paratrooper operation into Soviet supply hubs in the north succeeded. But by far the crown jewel of Greek conquest would be China, where I had established a full collaboration government in. Meaning I'd have 100% compliance in all of China if I capitulated then. Getting over the hump proved difficult, but after we did that, the Chinese front lines collapsed and the fertile territory of China, guaranteed that we'd survive any war of attrition to come. During this entire adventure, Spain joining the war against Germany finally proved to be the last nail in their 20 year long coffin. Alongside the Soviet menace in the east who have been fighting for their life for over a decade, coming back on top in the end and destroying Germany with their massive rebuilt hordes. At that point, the worst fear I had came true. Allied powers overwhelming Germany and leaving me as the last nation standing. But Germany had lasted long enough for me to get ready. I had manpower. I had established a powerful navy. I had built the best and largest air force in the world. I knew the Allied onslaught and the Soviet hordes would arrive soon. But I realized that now with the Southern Balkans under my control, the Macedonian Empire formable had become, finally, after more than a decade of work, possible. I had every state required, except for one, a Soviet state right on the northern front. As the Allied powers descended upon us with incredible might, 
I just by the skin of my teeth got my armies out of Hungary. And after that had to endure a horrendous supply situation alongside the air being contested. But eventually, our grand army stomped them in the Bosnian mountains. The allies were an unstoppable force meeting an immovable object. The skies were torn open over our epic showdown. The Hellenic Air Force succeeding despite almost all the world's air against them. And as I looked at the hundreds of allies, Soviet divisions with only my handful of infantry per tile matching them and succeeding in their defense of Greece. I couldn't help but think about the Spartan warrior focus, the one that described the battle of an outnumbered 4,000 Greeks slaying 20,000 Persians to stop them from passing further into Greece. Indeed, we had lost 3 million. The Allies? 30 million. As we now had descended upon the last state we needed, our quest at that moment, had been complete. We had simply to press one button. The Empire had been reborn. After this, we kept on moving, pushing deeper into the Soviet lands, not only on the northern front, but the Caucasus and Romania, where in every front we accomplished amazing feats. Encirclements, withstanding terrain massive armies were not meant to be in. Surviving encirclements. Eventually, these Soviet offenses ended, as our units were stretched too thin once more. And so I began focusing on fully bringing the entire Allied army in the Balkans under my sword. With one swift stroke, the Marines landed in Zara, power dropped onto the mountains, and with utmost coordination, the main front line began pushing, with them eventually tying up the noose. Our Spartans, this entire game, had accomplished feats unheard of. Feats only possible in legends, only those of gods. The war was over. It was time to throw in the towel and bring peace back not only to ourselves, but to the world. We did not conquer the UK, nor the US, nor even Germany, but we had to realize that any of those feats, at this point, were impossible. Our time holding the world by its neck was over. Our journey would end here. We came from nothing. A nation with lousy infrastructure. With two mills that could barely upkeep the army it had built. With a humble navy not fit for anything greater than the state it was built for. A position in the world that's simply a trade emporium for greater powers. A nation that was doomed to be ruled under foreign power if it kept going where it was going. It was sad to look at Greece in the beginning. But now, having had done what we did, I kind of yearn for those days again. The simple days. When the world felt massive. And our place in it yet to be discovered. In the end, even in our greatest glory, I would rather just go back to the beginning and start grinding again. Damn. Yeah. 